മാഡം വിജലേഷൻ മാഡം എത്ര പാർട്ടിസിപ്പൻസ് ആയി സുജി നമുക്ക് നോക്കിയാൽ കാണോ അല്ലേ अराउंड 30 42 അല്ലേ ആ ടോട്ടൽ ഓക്കേ ഫൈൻ ഓക്കേ ദെൻ വി സ്റ്റാർട്ട് യെസ് യെസ് ഓക്കേ വെരി ഗുഡ് ഈവനിംഗ് ഡിയർ ഫ്രണ്ട്സ് മൈ സെൽഫ് ഡോക്ടർ വിജയലക്ഷ്മി പ്രസിഡന്റ് കോഴിക്കോട് ഓഫ്താൽമിക് സൊസൈറ്റി a very warm welcome to all the post graduates to this module 1 of our pg training program uh, we are very delighted to see a good number of pgs have joined this session so welcome all the post graduates once more today we have with us a very eminent speaker and an academician dr anil radhakrishnan head of department of cornea and refractory services from amrita institute of medical sciences to enlighten all of you on the topic corneal topography and oct a warm welcome dr anil i request yeah. all of you to utilize this training program to the maximum and make it an interactive session and clear all your doubts now let me also welcome dr sandhya assistant professor of medical college kolikot to moderate this session welcome sandhya thank you madam Now let me invite Dr. Meher, our treasurer, Kolkata Ophthalmic Society, to introduce the speaker. Thank you all, and dear PGs, all the very best. So, good evening, all. Uh, at the outset, uh, wish you all a very happy onam in advance. So, this is uh, first of the series of interactive meetings uh, which we have planned uh, exclusively for postgraduates, and I request all postgraduates to make good use of this opportunity. and uh, feel free to post their questions and get all their doubts cleared we will also uh, record and upload today's presentation so that uh, you can share it with your friends uh, dr sandhya who is assistant professor of ophthalmology at mch uh, calicut will moderate today's session so the topic for today's uh, interactive session is corneal topography and uh, anterior segment oct Uh, to tell us how to properly read and interpret these charts we have with us uh, dr anil radhakrishnan from uh, amrita institute of medical sciences kochi dr anil uh, radhakrishnan did his ms in ophthalmology from minto eye hospital uh, bangalore he did his uh, cornea fellowship at uh, lv prasad eye institute he was the first surgeon in kerala to perform dalk dsek and dsaek he has performed over 500 corneal transplants and about 4000 lasik procedures he has seven international five national and about 50 uh, state level publications currently he is senior consultant and uh, hod cornea and refractive surgery at amrita institute of medical sciences kochi so i invite dr anil radhakrishnan uh, to speak on corneal topography and anterior uh, segment oct yeah uh yeah that's it uh, thank you uh, dr vijay lakshmi dr sujit and mehir shah uh, for the opportunity given i think it's uh, hard warming for me to participate in something that is happening in calicut because calicut is very dear to my heart i spent my undergraduate time in uh, one of the most enjoyable years in calicut uh, medical college so uh, i think in this talk today i would like to keep it a bit interactive so are there any how many post graduates are there now i think around 30 or so okay fine yeah. no around yeah. 40 40, 40. 40. 40. Yeah. yeah so with the permission of moderator dr santhia uh, i would uh, divide the talk into three three areas you know first i would be dealing with the basic topography then i would like to take some questions then maybe about uh, the corneal tomography that is pendra cam and related stuff and then anterior segment oct so so that the amount of boredom that you have would be minimized so what i feel is uh, the two most boring topics in cornea is one is dry eye second is corneal tomography and for people who are inclined uh, not reading this to to who are not really used to uh, interpreting corneal tomography it's a very very boring topic so i asked my postgraduate today morning 
uh, whether he has seen any presentation. So he was telling me he has seen multiple presentations, but has never made any sense of it. He was very honest with his answer. So I'll try to make it as uh, interactive and as simple as possible. Even though some, uh, some technicalities need to come into that, then only you can make a sense of it. So I'll start sharing the screen now. Uh, oh. I have to open the presentation first. No? Yeah, Mihir, is it visible? Yes, yes, Dr. Okay, fine. Yeah, thank you. So, shall I get going? Yeah, sure. Yeah, fine. So, yeah. So, I think I've uh, this. If you look at the scenery, you can see a lot of buildings there and a placid surface, water surface. But if you look more closely, you can see that there are minor imperfections in the image that you see here. So that is basically the principle of corneal topography. So if you have a object and a reflecting surface, you get an image. And in the in the and uh, minor imperfections would be highlighted if you have imperfections on the surface. There is one small difference with the cornea that it's a convex surface. So the imperfections would be sort of highlighted. It would be exaggerated. So that is the principle of corneal topography as well as keratometry. In fact, any uh, anything like that. Okay. So whether it's a placido based uh, based uh, topography or whether it is a keratometry, this is the essential principle that cornea acts as a convex mirror. Second, that the imperfections on the surface are highlighted, and if you know the size of the object and size of the image, you can know the curvature of the cornea or the surface which is reflecting it. So keratometry dates back to 1854, while uh, I think then came keratoscopy. Video keratography in its crude form came first in 1984. So like uh, almost uh, one and a half centuries since keratometry was discovered, then came uh, video keratography. So the disadvantage of keratometry is that it measures only a very small area and it makes an automatic assumption that a cornea is a symmetric zero cylinder. So if you have an irregular cornea, you would have seen, noticed that when you take keratometry readings, it would be very unpredictable. One reading would be very different from the other. So that is the reason for it. Then it, it's not accurate for very steep or very flat cornea. So this is the, uh, it's a basic TMS4 machine in which you have a, uh, topography system here, which is connected to a computer. And uh, you can see the, in the screen, you can see the output on the display system. And uh, you can take a printout of that also. So in video keratoscopy, you have these illuminated myers which are projected onto the cornea. And along each mire, you have about 256 points that are calculated. So you have a central fixation point. You have two video cameras on two sides. Uh, and uh, so there is a central fixation point and uh, the relation of each point in relation to the central fixation point is calculated using various algorithms. And that's how a color printout comes. And uh, there are various type of algorithms which I'll come into. So uh, the output, what you get is a color map like this. So you have this uh, multiple colors. If you see on the left-hand side, you can see that these are depicted over here. So, uh, like, uh, if you see this, the blue corresponds to very flat cornea. And uh, the red and uh, higher shades of red usually corresponds to a very steep cornea. There are other things which you need to look into, which are uh, basically 
the keratometry, steep keratometry, keratometry flat, the minimum K value or the cylindrical power. Then there is something called a surface regularity index and asymmetry index, which I'll be coming into later. So uh, I think for all practical purpose, what we look into is the axial map. So axial map is uh, something which, uh, which you can compare along different topographers. If you have an ISIS system or a TMS or a Atlas topography system or a Pendacam, so sagittal curvature would be same. Sorry, the axial map would be the same. So once it goes beyond the beyond 3.5 millimeter, it will not be accurate. So you have to make a correction for that. Uh, there is uh, something called a refractive power map also, which is available. So in that, what you look at is basically uh, beyond the central 3, 3.5 millimeter, you have to take into consideration the incidence of the rays and have to make necessary correction. So if you have a steel calibration ball, which has got a fortified diopter power, when you see with the axial curvature map, in the right in the center and the periphery, it will be uh, the same color. While in uh, refractive power map, there will be difference. Only in the central 3.5 3 millimeter, it would be similar to that of an axial curvature map. As it goes to the periphery, you have to take into consideration the uh, angle of incidence of the rays, so there will be change in the conical power also. So for practical purposes, what we look into is standard or absolute or axial curvature map. Refractive uh, power map also sometimes we look into. Other things are not very important. So just to oh, just to tell you about this, this is a patient who has undergone LASIK. So this is the um, axial curvature map, and this is a refractive power map. So in the central area, it is almost the same, but once you go beyond the central, say uh, five uh, five millimeters or so, you can see that the multiple change in color is happening. That is because of uh, uh, the variation power that is occurring. There is another algorithm which is called the instantaneous curvature, in which you look at points, the, the curvature, the, the, the uh, mapping is done based on the, in relation to the nearby point. So if you compare uh, the central 3.5 millimeter, or in fact, the central 5 millimeter area, it is almost same as in all the three maps. But if you look at this area, how can this be steep? This is in relation to this particular point. That's why it is appearing red. So uh, you can get erroneous information when you, if you look into instantaneous curvature map. So for all practical purpose, you have to look only at the axial curvature map. It's when you take topography, it's very important that you place the subject properly. You have to keep the eye aligned to the lateral candle marker and make sure that uh, you get a proper image. So a good keratograph will have minimum lit shadow. There will not be any dry spots. There will not be any pooling of TS. So this is the same patient when you do with, like if it's a perfect keratograph, you get an image like this. But if there is a dry eye, if the patient is keeping his eye open for a long period of time, you can see this multiple irregular patterns on the topography. Same thing here. This I deliberately asked the patient to keep the eye open for some time so that there is some pooling of tears. If there is pooling of tears, you can see that there will be steep areas. You'll be wondering what the hell is this? There is a steep area exactly at the central part. And that too, quite a bit of steep area. That is because of the meniscus from the uh, tear film. Okay, so if you have a large men meniscus, it can appear like a steep and cornea. So you have to be aware of that. This Again, this is uh, like uh, this right eye is perfectly normal while uh, this is, you can see that this area is very flat. Why is it so? I have asked the patient to look up and then I've taken a uh, keratograph. So if the patient is looking up, you can, the peripheral cornea will come into view and so it will be much more flatter. So you will get totally abnormal values. So you'll be aware of that. So you have to go back and look at the keratograph if you have any abnormal values. So in the absolute scale, I think you basically uh, in the normal range that is between 35 to 35.5 to 50.5, the color change occurs at 1.5 adapters. So less than 1.5, um, 1 you don't see a color change. But and uh, for 
getting uh, like more data beyond 35 point uh, less than 35.5.5 and beyond 50.5 you there is a color change would leave there is a change in uh, the dipteric power by high adapters so within the normal range that is between 35.5 to 50.5 that is a usual a normal keratometric range in that color change occurs only every 1.5 adapters this i'm not going into at this point of time so another two points you have to take into consideration one is surface asymmetry index in that uh, it is basically the summation of difference in corneal uh, power between the corresponding points corresponding points means like this is uh, one point here and one point here one point here and exactly opposite this point here this point and this point so uh, the corresponding points it's uh, if there is a difference between the corresponding points that shows that there is some irregularity of the cornea in a regular astigmatism it will be normal but in a irregular astigmatism or an abnormal shape of the cornea it would be abnormal so this takes into consideration in a placido based topography would be the four central rings and anything more than 0.5 is considered abnormal sri is another parameter so basically it looks at the local power fluctuation along 2 to 6 points Uh, you might remember that along one ring you see it you see about 256 points so along all 256 points you look at the local power fluctuations and this takes into consideration the 10 central mice this correlates well with the best corrected visual acuity and if sri goes beyond 2 it is clearly abnormal so the uh, sai surface asymmetry index more than 0.5 is abnormal sri more than 2 is abnormal then simulated k readings this is just like your k1 k2 in a keratometry uh, basically it looks at uh, data from between the 6th and 8th ring so average power of 12 points are taken into consideration this give that this gives data at around 2.5 mm from uh, of the cornea the central cornea so these are the normal topography patterns that you have you have round you have an oval pattern a superior steep inferior steep an irregular pattern a uh, symmetric bow tie a uh, symmetric bow tie with some skewing of red patches which i'll be coming into that, that basically tells you that the bows of the tie are not in one line then asymmetric bow tie one bow of the tie is larger than the other which can be superior or inferior then uh, asymmetric bow tie with uh, skewing of red patches this is something most pathognomonic this is something suggestive of uh, keratoconus so now with this uh, background information we can come back to this particular uh, picture so see this uh, i think we should start looking at uh, the values first so if you look at the just based on the colors you know that approximate values you know that it is 45 and 44 perfectly normal only thing is in this area the color is coming to somewhere around 47.5 that can most likely it would be normal it's basically that the patient has got astigmatism and uh, there is some amount of asymmetry in that so what about this this is a patient you have uh, you look at the colors just and you can see that it is coming in this range around 44 45 so everything is perfectly normal this is a round pattern that you see in a normal group what about this this is a you can see that there is an astigmatism here there is a bow tie like pattern but if you see the two bows of the tie are perfectly symmetrical more so in the right tie slightly less so on the other eye but if you look at it if you look at the keratometry values this is corresponding to something like 46 47 while this is corresponding to something like 49 48 but because of the fact that it is symmetrical this is most likely normal so you need more information to tell about other factors other values are normal shape factor q values and are, are all normal so uh just based on if it because you can you know that it is symmetrical this should be normal most likely this is almost a round pattern while this is an irregular pattern. but again these are all perfectly normal variants 
what about this? This the patient has got a localized steepening over here, while the other eye is perfectly normal. So how can you have one localized area of steepening? The first thing that you look at is you go back to the keratograph, see whether it is normal or not. You see whether there is any abnormality in the mire and take a second reading. And you ask the patient to blink a few times, take the value once more. It's seen that it's perfectly normal. So this is uh, the importance of the uh, rechecking the keratograph. There are certain uh, software uh, criteria available. I think this is uh, one of the common uh, Kleismeda uh, criteria. This is one of the software programs available. for it based, It's based on about 10 topographic indices based on which you can make a diagnosis of keratograms. So in uh, this is our Atlas machine has a similar one, which is called Pathfinder. ISIS has got something similar. Each uh, topography machines have got separate, separate things. Uh, so in this, uh, you just look at the topography, you can uh, make out that the patient has got a, a very gross asymmetry. This is a coordinates appearing corresponding to something like 37 or 38, while this is corresponding to something like 53. So there cannot be a normal cornea like that. And there is totally asymmetry between two parts of the cornea, two halves of the cornea. So you know that it, it has to be a corneal ectasia or an abnormal corneal shape unless proved otherwise. So there are other things available in the, <clears throat> in the topography system. Uh, you have something called a power difference map. I think it's all not very important. I think uh, elevation maps are also available in topography system. But if it's a placido based uh, topographer, there is a very, it's only in a very approximation. It is not at all, uh, the elevation map cannot be re uh, really relied on. Uh, now I'll come to a few conditions. One of the first things would be keratoconus. So in keratoconus, as I've told uh, so many times, even now before, that you see that there is a steepening of cornea in one particular area. So in the right eye, it's a very mild keratoconus. Only in the inferior part, inferior half, you see some steepening. And if you look at the K value, it's something like Hello? Am I audible, Sujit? Uh, yes, sir. Yes, you are audible. Uh, you see that uh, there is a uh, like there is a minimal steepening as compared to the but uh, if you look at the values you can see but the important information based on the information that we have we know that surface asymmetry index which is normally about 0.5 it is very much increased in this si is more than 1.5 Usually, uh, whichever pathology, most of the keratoconus and most of the ectatic disorders will have this mirror image symmetry or an angiomorphism. So if you look at the other eye, you can see that the it's really red in color, very red in color. If you look at the cave, with the corresponding color coding, you know that it's definitely more than uh, 55 or so in the central part. So if it, if it is anything more than 47.5, 48, you know that it's abnormal. So up to anywhere between say 37 to 45, 46, even up to 47 can be considered normal. Once it crosses 47.2, you have to oh, view it with suspicion. And if it comes to 48 and uh, 49, 50 like that, it has to be a pathology unless proved otherwise. Let's uh, go back to a patient who has got a uh, symmetric bow tie pattern or an astigmat. This is my own picture, my own topography image. You can see that there's a symmetric bow tie. This is corresponding to say, I told you before 48.5 to nine. But the difference is that it's symmetrical, perfectly symmetrical. In contrast to this, it is totally asymmetrical. <clears throat> so this is another example. You just need to look at the uh, color coded image. So look at the color corresponding to this. This is corresponding to somewhere more than 58. So once it crosses say 48, you know that it's abnormal. I think I'm not going to any other details. Then there is, the, there is a change in the shape also. You can know that there is a 
total uh, lack of symmetry between two bows of the tie. Then there is a asymmetric bow tie with this skewing of radial axis, which will be coming in. Another example, this is a patient who has got a lot of red here. So what do you infer? Just look at the color coding. It is more than 49.5. If you look at the steep K and the flat K, it is 54 and 48, clearly out of the normal range. So this has to be keratoconus unless proved otherwise. What about this? This K1 and K2, 44.7, 46.87, almost well within normal limits. But if you look at the K value, you look at the maximum color or maximum steepest area. At this area, the color is corresponding to 49.5. The fellow eye, this color is corresponding to, I think uh, in this map, uh, this is not actually exactly standard scale. So this will be corresponding to something like 54, 50 or 51. So this is again is clearly abnormal. One thing just by the color, you can say it's abnormal. So if you want to say uh, based on color, you have to know that you have to have, look at the axial curvature map and then look at the color coding. Then uh, you know that the symmetry is also absolutely not there. Between two halves of the cornea, this is a very small bow tie and this is a very large bow. And then between the two, like there is a change in the orientation also. So this is what we call skewing of radial axis. Whenever you have an asymmetric bow tie, if it is a regular uh, astigmatism, normally the two bows of the tie would be in one line. While in a, if there is a skewing of radial axis, there will be an angle between the two. So some minor degree up to 10 degrees is normal, up to 12 can be considered normal. But if it is beyond 20 degrees, it is abnormal, clearly abnormal. So again, in this patient, uh, K1, uh, uh, K1, K2, K1 is 47.57 or something. This is 43.75. Not clearly abnormal, but if you see the shape is totally abnormal. And if you have to look at uh, the color coding corresponding to this, this value would correspond to something like 50. So this is again totally abnormal. Similar example there. So this is the software that you have to diagnose keratoconus. Okay, so that was about uh, the normal topography and the most common normal variant that you see. Then you come to oh, the application of topography before cataract surgery. So this is one of the common indications nowadays. If you have a patient who's looking at a premium IOL, and the patient has got a topography pattern like this. Will you consider a, um, a multifocal lens? So when you see that this patient has got a really multifocal cornea, the central two or 2.5 millimeter has, see this area is corresponding to something like uh, 35. This part is coming to something like 56. This area is corresponding to something like 44. This central area is corresponding to 44.5, 43. So he has got a like totally abnormal cornea in the central 2 to 0.5 millimeter, which is not a good thing. So this is not a candidate for a multifocal. So if you have to have a regular topography pattern. At the same time, this patient has got astigmatism. You know that uh, the two bows of the tie are there. They are in one line. If you look at uh, this area versus this area, you have to look at the superior versus inferior area. And uh, at about uh, at one particular point, you have to see. So these are almost corresponding. So this patient can be considered for a premium IOL. Only thing is, you cannot go for a spherical multifocal IOL. If at all you are going for a multifocal, you have to go for a toric multifocal IOL. What about this patient? This patient also has a very symmetric uh, bow tie pattern. The axis is about 170 or so, but perfectly symmetrical. The K values are perfectly within the normal range, 43. This is 43.5. The corresponding points are matching. So this is a good candidate for premium IO. What about this? This patient, again, this area, it is coming to 43. Here 42.3, here 41.2. Again, there is some disparity, not a very good candidate for multifocal. So this is uh, 
this is another application of uh, topography. Uh, this patient has undergone keratoplasty and uh, he has a, a topography like this. This is 49.89, 41.46, a cylinder of 8.43. What will you do? Will you do refractive surgery? No. So first thing, if it's a post keratoplasty, you have to see whether sutures are present or not. So you do a suture removal and uh, address it. This is a patient who uh, actually came for cataract surgery. So you see that, uh, sorry, you see that there is, K1 is 53.25, 49.02. There is a cylinder of 4.25. Uh, definitely not a patient, not a candidate for multifocal, but uh, Toric also, he may not be a very good candidate. You have to tell him that there is a quite a bit of his, uh, irregular astigmatism and then maybe you can consider Toric uh, IOR in this patient. So he has got a large cylinder and a very steep cornea. So that is about uh, cataract surgery. Now, uh, this is a patient who has got something called a contact lens induced warp piece. It's a typical topographic pattern. So unlike uh, keratoconus, keratoconus usually the steepness of the cornea is seen not exactly inferiorly, it's either inframedial or infralateral. While in a contact lens induced warp page, you see that it's exactly at the inferior location. This is seen with RGP lenses only. Nowadays, it's not seen at all. I have not seen it for so many years. Now. So there is a sudden bump in the keratometry value and it, the exact inferior location uh, tells you that it is a contact lens induced warpage. Soft contact lens also can cause corneal warpage. So this is a, uh, a patient who has got a somewhat regular astigmatism in the right eye. If you look at the left eye, you know that there are multiple areas of tear breakup. You can see this uh, abnormal pattern in corneal topography, which, which actually the topographer interprets as uh, keratoconus suspect. But what is this? This is because of a break in the keratogram. This is usually related to dry eye. So if you the, treat the patient with lubricants, mostly it should it will settle down. After one week, it was like this. After three weeks, after two weeks and three weeks, it was a consistent pattern. So this patient has got a normal topography. Maybe uh, uh, you can consider a practice surgery in such a patient. This is an example of a topography uh, map which shows descended ablation. Normally, in a elastic patient, you have to the centration has to be exactly centered. So, in the central three millimeter, the cornea should be of one color. So, this is corresponding to something like uh, thirty six, while this would correspond to something like forty four. If you have a so much disparity in the central two two point five millimeter of the cornea, you will have a lot of uh, problems, visual phenomena. Uh, you can have doubling, you can have glare, splitting of images and all that. So this is a, a classical example of a descended ablation. This is again of academic interest, like mainly seen in patients who undergo PRK. And now that PRK has come back into work, you can see that uh, this patient has undergone LASIK treatment. You have got a flat cornea in the central part. In the central area, you can see some small areas of focal steepening. Which, are, which is called uh, central island. Okay, fine. Uh, this I think we dealt with the case of earlier. So uh, this is a patient who has undergone keratoplasty. If you look at the cornea, how abnormal is this cornea? You see the values over here, it is coming to say, 50.5, 55 like that. While this area, it is very flat. It is coming to 35.5. So actually the patient has got a graft ectasia over here. So there is a compensatory steepening that is, actually this part is flat and uh, in the lower part, he has got a ectasia, which is sort of bulged out. So because of it's a plaster-based image, you cannot image free. That's why it is shown a pattern like that. Pendecam or one of the newer topography machine, uh, devices, you can exactly see the bulge of the cornea here. Topography is also useful in objective assessment of dry eye. 
so if you see this tear breaker pattern, you know that the patient has got dry eyes. So uh, this topography, as I said before, came in the uh, late 80s, 87, 88, like that. And I think uh, within the next one decade, uh, multiple topographies came. ISIS was one of the popular ones. TMS2 came, then came TMS3 and TMS4. And in late 1990s, OPSCAN or elevation ba based uh, instruments came into being. So I think uh, before we go into OPSCAN, I would like to uh, take any questions if it is there. Yes, sir, we have some questions. Uh, Dr. Jinsi is asking, should the steepening lie within the central 3.5 millimeters for it to be significant? If uh, a steep... Uh, I didn't understand. Can you tell once more, ma'am? Should the steepening lie within the central 3.5 millimeters uh, for it to be significant? If a steepening seen beyond the center, should it be considered reliable? Okay, okay. So it depends on the topography system that you are using. Okay. So most of the time, uh, there will be effect in the central 3.5 millimeter. But for example, if it's an early pellucid marginal degeneration, you'll not see anything in the central cornea. You, unless you do a, a placido, no, sorry, unless a pendecam imaging, you may not be able to detect. Very subtle uh, pellucid marginal degeneration, you may not see anything in the central 3.5 millimeter. But if it is if it goes to a state that the vision is affected or uh, like if there is some irregular astigmatism, then uh, there will be central effect. Unless there is a central effect, there will not be any symptoms for the patient. Okay, sir. So one more question. What is the basic difference between normalized and absolute scale? Okay. In, I didn't mention much about the, uh, I didn't mention at all about the normalized scale. For the uh, benefit, I'll just go, go back. Yeah, in the absolute scale, you can compare with different topography machines. So that is a universally uh, accepted uh, scale because between 35.5 to 50.5, there is a color change happening only at 1.5 diopters. Beyond that, only at five diopters, there is a color change. While in a normalized scale, what you do is basically, whatever is the curvature of the cornea, that is divided into 11 equal steps. Again, depending on the machine, some machines it is even less than that. Then in a uh, TMS4, uh, there is uh, this, uh, every color change happens with 0.4 diopter change in a normalized scale. So, uh, So this patient, can you see the slide here? Can you see the slide here? Yes, sir. Yeah. So in this patient has an absolute scale like this. So this is a almost a symmetric bow tie pattern. While in a normalized scale, you can see a multiple colors. You can see that this part of the cornea is quite flat. So this is corresponding to something like 40.1. And this is corresponding to something like 45 or 46. So this is the difference. You uh, see a difference in the colors. That is why it is not a great idea to look at the normalized scale. Okay, sir. So for uh, theory exam or for uh, uh, maybe if you are doing research in uh, keratoconus or something like that, normalized scale may be useful. But for comparing uh, with other topography machines for practical purposes, this is normalized scale is not used. So hope Najla, it's clear to you. Then again, another question, but I think it's already answered. Actually, it is while reading a topography, is there a preferable scale? Any difference in accuracy? So, as yes, I said, yeah. 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 Okay. so sir, one more question, sir. What is the current role of this placido based topography present? No, I think the uh, great uh, advantage with placido is that it is very sensitive, especially for the anterior uh, curvature. The only, only problem is like it, it is. Also sensitive to abnormalities in the tear film. Also sensitive to, to, to like if you do an applination tonometry and then do placido based topography, it will be abnormal. Okay, uh, but at the same time, it's very sensitive to pick up early keratoconus. That is why most of the even the newer uh, topography systems 
they use a combination of placido and OCT. I'm not talking about Vicente, uh, Vicente Omni imaging, which is out of production now. Even the anterior is using a, a placido because the sensitivity of a placido based uh, topography system is more than that of the pentacam. There's no doubt about that. So that is why people are uh, still uh, going on with Placido, even though there are some disadvantages for it. So it would be better for us as a screening tool, right, sir? Definitely it is a screening tool, but the only thing is if you want to, like, uh, obviously in the Placido base, you're looking only at the anterior curvature anterior. of the cornea. And the disadvantage is like beyond the central, say, 6.5 millimeter, it, is, it uh, may not give you good values. So you cannot get limbus to limbus imaging, mm -hmm. unlike Pentacam. But uh, most of the pathologies, in fact, 95% uh, of it would happen in the central, say, 5 or 6 millimeters. So, uh, it is very useful. There's no doubt that Placido is very useful. Okay. Thank you, sir. So, that's all for the questions. Now, I think we can proceed to the next session. Right, yeah. sir? Now, uh, I think then in the late 1990s came OPSCAN. So, then this concept of uh, tomography came. So, uh, people were talking about, uh, till that point of time, only anterior curvature of the cornea was talked about. Now, the thickness of the cornea, the posterior curvature of the cornea, and the, uh, and the shape of the posterior curvature also, also taken into consideration, which was a big revelation. I remember the uh, commotion it caused in the late 90s because that was the time I was doing post-graduation. And in uh, 2001, the first device came in India. I think I was, uh, it, I think it came in RP Center and in... Uh, LV Prasad Institute. Uh, so I was there at that point of time. So people were really uh, <laughs> thrilled about this off scan device. But like our uh, Nokia mobile phone, it did not get too many updations. And so it went, it's still a very useful device, but there are much better systems now. That's why it has got relegated. So uh, this, uh, when you see, well, I think when you look at tomography, you have to take into consideration two things. One is, uh, you know that there is a steep meridian and a flat meridian. So there is something called a best fit sphere. So this is this uh, light green color, what you're seeing is the best fit sphere. So oh, the steep cornea would be like this, while a flat cornea would be like this. So correspondingly, the image would come like this. Corresponding to the steep meridian, you can see that blue color. So don't uh, misinterpret it for a flat cornea. Only thing is, compared to that reference sphere, that part of the cornea, is, it's away, that's all. While this is a, this is, this meridian is the uh, steeper meridian, okay? So uh, based on the reference sphere or uh, the, the best fit sphere, you can, uh, see points which are above it or below it. So uh, this is the anterior float. The certain areas are above that particular curvature and while certain are certain points are below it. This is the posterior float. The, in the posterior float also, like in the posterior, if you look at the posterior curvature also, there is a, a standard curvature and some of the points are appearing really above that. That is why it is appearing so like this. And along with that, you see the axial curvature map and you see the uh, pachymetry map. Axial curvature is map is just similar to what we were describing, the Placido-based uh, map system, exactly similar to the other topo, DMS-4 or ISO software. This is a pachymetry map. This is computed based on the anterior curvature and the posterior curvature. Opscan, it uses a scanning slit technology. It takes about, I think, uh, 20 slits from one side and at, in each slit, I think around 240 points are taken. And based on which a, a, a map of the cornea is projected. So pachymetry can be really abnormal if the posterior float is uh, abnormally uh, measured. Okay, so for example, after uh, elastic, so after elastic or refractive surgery, quite often there, is, there are errors in the measurement of the posterior float. Then this pachymetry map cannot be relied upon in uh, devices like OPSCAM. So then came uh, Pendacam in 2001. That 
that gave a exactly a really a new dimension to uh, the imaging system and now that has become standard for any refractive surgery so pendecam uses something called shame flug imaging if you look at the shame flug imaging it's not something really new this uh, this uh, theodor shameflug uh, actually described this procedure way back in 1906 so he was a, a aviator actually in the military i think in from austria so he was not very keen on continuing in military but at the same time was interested in physics and technology and a lot of stuff like that and so he devised images for aerial photography from the balloons at that time uh, the planes were not really there so uh, with the uh, balloons they used to take uh, axial images sorry the aerial images from the hot air balloons so he devised this shame flug imaging so that the uh, there is more area can be covered and better details could be covered so the shame flug image the long and short of it is that normally in a, any imaging system the object image and lens has to be in one line and uh, basically it has to be uh, the rays would be uh the incident rays would be perpendicular onto it while in uh, a shame flug imaging it is not so so there is increased depth of focus and there is more detail also available so this gives out a, a print out like this with something similar to that of op scan you get a front curvature map in which you have a reference sphere and some of the points are about that as you see here so the advantage of op scan is all along there are uh, numerical markings like this sorry uh, about pendecam is that lot of numerical markings like this are there and it is much more uh, the software also is much more friendly to the examiner so that you can get a lot of information from what is uh, what device has measured then this this is sagittal curvature map is corresponding to our axial curvature this is exactly same as our axial curvature map this is the elevation map i was talking about so uh, compared to the best fit sphere some points are below some points are above that this is the best fit sphere for the back sur back surface and based on these you you measure the corneal thickness also so you can have a cord map you can have a look at all the four and look at the abnormalities so uh, in uh, if you look at the best fit sphere any anti elevation is not abnormal so anything uh, less than 12 microns is considered perfectly normal while anywhere between 12 to 15 may be considered as suspect and anything more than 15 microns should be considered as abnormal so here you can see this images you can see that here it is plus 4 uh, plus 14 minus 11 minus 37 like that so but this is like in the peripheral part this is a patient who has got astigmatism so you expect this areas to be high so don't uh, look into that actually in this patient you have to look at the you have to have a toric surface then only you can basically uh, you can basically uh, evaluate it if you are looking at the best fit sphere posterior elevation in thing more than 5 microns is considered as abnormal but 5 microns i think it's it's too much like a lot of them will have 5 microns so generally we don't consider anything uh, more than 10 microns as significant but if you instead of best fit sphere if you go for a toric surface toric means it has taken into consideration the astigmatism also best fit toric ellipsoid the anti any anti elevation more than 12 microns is considered abnormal any elevation more than 15 Uh, up to 15 is considered normal anything more than 15 is abnormal so there is something else also in this you can look at the uh, spatial profile or the corneal thickness spatial profile so this is like the growth chart what you have in pediatrics this is the a perfectly normal child and these are the two oh, like if you if this falls within these two areas it is perfectly normal so you should see the progression or a change of the corneal thickness in the um, it is basically an indicator of the of uh, the profile of the cornea and this is a map which shows the percentage decrease or increase of the cornea so if this is if this is corresponding to oh, this line is parallel to any of this this should be considered as perfectly normal 
So this uh, pachymetry progression in this is anywhere between 0.8 to 1.1 is normal. But if it is beyond that, that is totally abnormal. That is like in uh, conditions like corneal ectasia, you know that there is the central cornea is much more thin and the, but the peripheral cornea is normal in size in the early cases. So there is a big difference between the central cornea and the peripheral cornea. That is why the uh, pachymetry progression index would be very high in people with keratoconus. So this is what I was uh, talking about. So you can see that from here, it, there will be a sudden drop. So this can occur in uh, any abnormal corneas, whether it is from, from prostate keratoconus or uh, whether it is uh, proper keratoconus. So if it, in, if it is one point, just above 1.1, 1 .1, you consider it as from, from prostate keratoconus. But uh, in uh, real keratoconus, it would be much uh, worse than that. I don't know why it is disappearing. Okay, uh, so uh, okay, I think there is some problem with the time setting. So I will I just tell that. So if the you have to look at the uh, after looking at the quad map, you have to look at the uh, thing which is. So in the printout, first you look at the chord maps, then you look at the data over here. So that data I have uh, actually uh, magnified it. So you have to look at the cornea front surface and the back surface. And uh, this is the most important parameter, K-max, or maximum curvature of the cornea. This is coming to 46.1 in this particular case, which should be taken as normal. This is uh, like, uh, you can see the pachymetry in the pupillary center, the pachymetry in the apex of the cornea, and uh, the thinnest local. And if there is a change of more than, uh, I think, 5 microns between these two, sorry, 10 microns between these two, this should be considered as abnormal, between pachymetry apex and the thinnest local point. There are other parameters also, cornea volume, antechamber depth, and all that. And there is some one uh, area where you can enter the IOP. Uh, like uh, you can, the correction for the IOP is automatically given in Pentacan. So, oh, the other, I think we'll come into oh, more elaborately about the discussion of uh, interpretation of Pentacan data later. So, this is another thing which you have to consider, just like what I was telling in the um, uh, topography interpretation between two corresponding points you have to see at the same point you have to see how much is the change in the thickness this area versus thickness this area if the thickness is more than if there is a change more than 30 microns that should be considered significant if in a normal cornea the pachymetry map would be symmetrical while in a keratomet in a, a patient with the keratoconus there will be abnormal decrease in the pachymetry in the central part There is another uh, concept in uh, Pentacam called, uh, uh, the, there is, I think I was telling about the back fit sphere. So, uh, if you have got a keratoconus, if you calculate the uh, back surface, it will be something like this. If you take into consideration this as well as this. There is something called the enhanced BFS in which you eliminate the area of the cone and then calculate this. So, the localized protrusion would be highlighted. This is something very useful in enhanced BFS is something very useful in a pentacam. So let's look at two, three, two, two, three pentacam reports. So this is a patient who has got, you can see that it is sagittal curvature, which is the most important one. You can see the values are 47.6, 46.6. The almost corresponding points are quite okay. If you look at the front elevation map, the front elevation is coming to only 7 microns, perfectly normal. Pachymetry map, this is coming to 515, this is 580, this is 640. This is again perfectly normal. While if you look at the posterior elevation, there, is some, there are some places where you see plus 13, plus 12 like that. And that too in the significant part, in the central 4 millimeter area. And there is one point which is plus 17. So uh, this is the advantage of had this 
patient undergone a routine placebo topography, you would have seen that the sagittal curvature, everything is perfectly normal. You can see the corresponding points are normal. It would be a very symmetric body pattern. While in this, you can see that in the back curvature or the uh, in the back surface, you can see that there is a focal elevation in the cornea. We'll look into the values now. Again, here you can see that the, the central 512, that is normal, apex is 515. The inner local is 509. So there is hardly any difference, hardly any, some six micron difference, perfectly normal. K max, the maximum characterometry is only 47.6, which is perfectly normal. So this parameter is also perfectly normal. But there is some other thing called uh, this one, just called bad. Bellin Ambrosia Enhanced Ectasia System. This is very useful for the diagnosis of keratoconus. So the front elevation map, it looks into six points, basically. One is the elevation map. The back elevation map, there is an abnormality over here. Then it, uh, as I told before, the enhanced, uh, that uh, back float surface map, it will be comparing with. When you compare with that, you can see that this elevation is much more than 13 microns. It is coming to 23, 18, like that. This is some, a map which is comparing with the standard map. So there is a difference in both front as well as the back surface. So there are <clears throat> uh, multiple parameters based on which they come into this D. D value, the final D value is the one that tells you whether the uh, map is normal or abnormal. D, F means the front curvature. This is showing some abnormality. D, B is the back curvature. This is also showing some abnormality. Anything more than two is clearly abnormal. Anything more than 1.5 is suspicious. The pachymetry map also, like if you see the corneal thickness spacious profile, it is starting from here and it is crossing and coming over here. So here also there is a small abnormality. And if you see the percentage thickness increase from here, it just drops down. So even though the uh, sagittal curvature map was perfectly normal, this patient is having an abnormal topography. The final D value is coming to 2.74. This patient is not a candidate for neurofractive surgical procedure. Because if this, is, this can be considered as a keratoconus suspect. And if you do this, uh, topography, uh, sorry, uh, laser vision correction in this patient, there's a chance that the patient might have a ectasia. So this is what I was telling about Bellin Ambrosio and hence uh, ectasia scale. So it takes into consideration six values and gives the final D value. Don't look into one value in isolation. It may be abnormal. It's uh, just like uh, you're seeing your, uh, your uh, field printout, Humphrey visual field printout. Based on one particular value, you cannot say. The final value should be taken into consideration. So as I was telling before, bad up to 1.5 is perfectly normal. Anything more than 1.65 is considered as suspect. And anything more than two is abnormal unless proved otherwise. You look at the topography of the same patient of the other eye. Even in the sagittal curvature map, you can see that it's coming to 49.6 and 48.6. And the both of the tie are not in one line. This is almost straight. This is there is some skewing of radial axis over here. So just based on this, you can see this is abnormal. And uh, Berlin Ambrosia enhanced uh, ectasia display system shows, as expected, abnormalities in one of almost all the maps and a D value of 3.19, which is clearly abnormal. Another example. What about uh, this patient? This patient is having uh, K values of 48 and 46.7. Uh, again, I think it's definitely on the steeper side. But if you look at the other elevation maps, the front elevation map, clearly with the normal limits. Even the back elevation map is normal. Actually, the central two millimeter, no values crossing more than 10 microns. Thickness map is also perfectly normal. If you look at the Bellin Ambrosio enhanced ectasia display, you can see that elevation maps are normal. There is minimal abnormality here, but the difference maps are perfectly normal. Only, only problem in this is the patient has got a very steep gate. 
he has got 48 diacres and 47.3, but there is nothing to really suggest ectasia. Uh, so you cannot really call it keratoconus or keratoconus suspect at this point of time. This patient, if you like, if the patient wants, you can actually consider refractive surgery, but obviously you cannot do a microkeratome based uh, elastic procedure. What about this? This is uh, again 46.8, 48.2. Once it crosses, say 48, you have to think that it is keratoconus unless proved otherwise. But elevation map normal, the back curvature map normal, corneal thickness map normal. If you look at the K max, it is coming to 48.2, which is really on the higher side, but uh, other parameters are all uh, well with the confidence. You see the enhanced display. This is uh, normal, this is normal, while this map shows a post elevation change. While the corresponding map of the right eye was perfectly normal, you could, uh, if the uh, patient, uh, if it was only right eye, we could have told that the patient could have had refractive surgery the, with the, taking into consideration the steep cornea. But if you look at the enhanced curvature uh, map, you can see that it's clearly abnormal. It's really beyond 15. K okay, max is high. So among the D values, only one value is high, but this is somewhat high. So the total D is coming to 2.2. So if you look at both eyes, you can see that this patient is not a candidate for refractive surgery. Mm, okay, so that is, uh, I think I have a few slides more, yeah. So uh, this is uh, about uh, shame fluke imaging. Now we'll move on to anterior segment OCT, which came in 2005. And uh, Carl Seiss had this idea of combining Placido, which is very sensitive to, to pick up uh, anterior curvature abnormalities and combine it with an OCT, which can measure the corneal thickness very well and to uh, bring out a device called Visante Omni, which came out in 2009. So there is plastic-based system, then, also, then there is registration happening. And so that uh, this point is exactly corresponding to the central point over here. Otherwise, the, you can't do that. Then with that, you can calculate the posterior curvature. So anti elevation from uh, atlas topography, then you have uh, uh, you can measure the OCT and with which you can measure the post elevation. So this also gives similar uh, printouts like Pendacan. Uh, this is the device what I'm using uh, there. So it gives also anterior axial curvature. Then uh, there is something called a mean curvature also. So in short, you can have, you look at the cornea and you can see the mean curvature of the patient, but not very useful. The pachymetry map is something useful in that uh, if there is a focal in, uh, decrease in the pachymetry, you can pin, uh, pinpoint out. And uh, this relative pachymetry map, like up to 10 percentage uh, decrease can be normal. But if it goes beyond 13 or 14 percent, it is clearly abnormal. This is something similar to that of OPSCAN or that of a Pendacam, and the elevation map and the post elevation map. So in Vicente Omni, the other advantage is that you have an OCT along with it. So you can see the uh, OCT images also. Like this is a patient who has got a Desmet's membrane detachment when seen at this. So uh, I would <clears throat> say that uh, the corneal tomography has come a long way from the OPSCAN system that we had in 2000. And, uh, 2000. The first you have, I think this is an important slide for probably postgraduates. You have a scanning slit-based technology which is OPSCAN, even now it is present, it is used also for refractive surgery. And because shame fluke uh, images, imaging came up in a big way, that has become much more popular nowadays. The, uh, the first device which came based on shame fluke imaging was Pendacam, then came dual shame fluke imaging, which is uh, used in Galilee as well as Sirius. Then you, the, there was Galilee G4 in which they combined the Placido along with shame fluke imaging. The idea was the shame fluke was slightly less accurate and uh, um, sensitive in picking up anterior curvature abnormalities. So they wanted to use the uh, Placido based also and they came up with the device called Galilee G4. TMS5 also come, uh, uses the same technology. 
Same thing with Schwinn Sirius. And Sirius Combi Analyzer uses uh, Placido, Schwinn Sirius, Placido plus Shame Flow, plus it is combined with Abrometer also. Uh, then you have uh, Placido plus OCT, which is the classic one is Visante Omni, which is a time domain OCT. Uh, and nowadays, uh, the OCT has got much more revolutionary, has uh, undergone a lot of revolutionary changes. Now we have got a scan, a scanning split technology, sorry, SWEPS source technology OCT. The, uh, the prototype is, not the prototype, wait, this is a, another one from uh, Sirius called CSO MS39. And uh, very recently, it is Antirion has, Heidelberg has come up with Placido plus OCT along with the A scan, which is called Antirion. Very expensive machine, but it has got cornea. It can accurately measure uh, the intraocular lens power. It does everything what an IOL master does and uh, what a best uh, appendix device does. Okay, so this is it. Scanning slit technology, only one device is there, OPSCAN. Shame flow imaging, multiple devices are there. The prototype is Pendacam, but you have Galili and Sirius. Then you have a combination of two, that is Placido plus Shame flow, which is used in Galili G4 and TMS5. Placido, along with OCT, is used in Visante Omni, that was the oldest. Uh, have uh, serious and very latest. This is uh, something that is quite useful. This is a patient who had undergone a uh, undergone an option and uh, found that the patient has got keratoconus. The lowest frequency was seen to be for a C3. So it was a very young lady. So uh, can you ask Sumaya to be muted? Hello? Yeah. So, uh, when we saw this, I thought uh, the patient would be unfit for c 3 I did an ultrasound uh, pachymetry, which is considered the gold standard for pachymetry. Found that the thickness was coming to near about 400 microns. And I did a anterior segment uh, imaging with Visante Omni, found that it was coming to 410 microns. So the patient was considered fit for a C3R procedure. As you know, C3R cannot be done if the corneal thickness is very low. If it goes to less than uh, 370 or 380, most people will not do it. So in the op scan, it was uh, erroneously interpreted as 325 microns, but actual uh, bacchymetry was something closer to 400 which as suggested by ultrasonic pachymetry and by OCT. So that is about uh, the tomography system. I think I need to... Okay, fine. So you have any uh, doubts regarding that? Before I go to anterior segment OCT, I would take doubts from uh, yes, uh, tomography system. Yeah, one question is there yeah. from Kartiga. How often uh, topography done in keratoconus suspect? Is it always necessary to repeat the same type of imaging on follow-up? Either be OPSCAN or Pentacam. Okay, fine. I think that's a very valid question because uh, quite often we see patients coming from with multiple colored uh, printouts with multiple systems and you can't compare the two. I think uh, it's always better to compare th with the same system. Then only you can give a, a, a give a reasonably good impression whether it is progressing or not. Even if you have the same system, very diff quite often it's very difficult to make a comment whether it is progressing or not. So if you are, are comparing with uh, multiple system, it would be much more difficult. If at all you want to do it, uh, what you can do is the uh, looking at the color coded maps and. Uh, get an approximate idea of uh, how is the change in color and so how is the change in keratometry happening. No further questions actually. Okay. Dr. Anil, if PGs are not asking questions, you can ask them questions, okay? <laughs> So I am only looking, I am seeing a lot of blank screens, man. <laughs> okay. We can ask them to show the video once the talk is over. Hmm. Okay.
So I'll be, uh, I think next uh, 10 minutes or so, I'll be talking about Andy, the segment OCT. It will not be a very comprehensive. Uh -huh. So this so I think it's possible. Uh -huh. Okay, and the segment is actually a, a very good non-invasive tool to see cross-sectional images of the anterior segment. So you can get three-dimensional high-resolution imaging uh, of the anterior segment of the corpus. So the device uh, based on which I'm going to base my presentation is this particular one, which is called Visante Omni Imaging. Uh, so in uh, OCT, what we use is the conventional OCT. I think what we use is 830 nanometers. So the, uh, the advantage with OCT, the 830 nanometers OCT is that the fidelity is much better. If you look at the OCT images of Dr. Sujit, you can know that uh, the, it looks very crisp. It is very clear. That is because it uses a swept source OCT and uh, the, the, uh, the frequency used is 830 nanometers. While in anterior segment OCT, what is used in Visante Omni imaging, it is 1310, the frequency. So the penetration is more at the cost of fidelity or uh, clarity. So for imaging corneal epithelium and stuff like that, it may be better to use uh, the swept source OCT uh, of 830 nanometers. But for looking at uh, ciliary body and scleral spur, this would be more useful. And the segment OCT would be more useful. So as the uh, the frequency is more, actually there is better penetration, and so you cannot see all the angle details, but Compared to the conventional A30 NM uh, OCT, the angle details are better seen. Uh, this, as you know, is a time domain OCT, so the capture time is more. But you can see that this is the cornea, this is the sclera. You can have, even though you cannot see exactly the ciliary body region, you know that this area there is a scleral spur. You can see approximately some part of the ciliary body at least. While in spectral domain OCT, it is because it's web source technology, uh, the image capture is much faster. The image quality is definitely better, but the penetration is less. So you cannot see anything in the ciliary body region. So Visante, you can see the entire uh, circumference of the cornea, like limbus to limbus, you can see. While in a conventional web source, you can see only the central part. 6 into 2 mm part is usually seen. While in a Visante, you can see 16 into 6 mm. While the swept host source has the advantage that, see this patient who has got a peripheral ulcerative keratitis. You can see the epithelium here. There is a quite a bit of corneal thinning over here and the epithelium has really thickened in this particular area. You can measure the corneal thickness also in this area. While this is not possible in a Visante only system. While uh, another example, you can see the, the corneal thickness can be exactly measured. The small microbullae can be made out. You can see the anterior stromal infiltrate very well and the shadowing underneath that. This is a patient who has undergone uh, PRK. I think uh, this area you can see the epithelium, while in this area you can see that it is de epithelized. And you can see the uh, Decimates membrane folds, the posterior stromal folds are much more well made out in this. So, I will be basically detailing about anterior, uh, this one, Visante Omni system, which I have access to, more access to. So, this is a patient who has got a DM detachment. There is no need to see OCT to make this out. You can, with a proper SITNAB examination, you can make out. But with OCT, you can actually demonstrate it to the patient. This area, the DM is well attached and the cornea is thin over here. While in this area, there is corneal edema and there is a DM, which is a membrane-like thing. And there are multiple modules with which you can do the uh, OCT. Visante Omni gives you a lot of advantage uh, regarding the, the scope of imaging. Like this is a high-resolution corneal imaging. You can see that... Uh, 
compared to this area, which is the cornea is clear, this area is edematous and it is, uh, you can see that it is opalescent. This is post uh, uh, this one C3F8 injection. You can see that the same patient has got a clear cornea now and the DM is attached. Keratoconus, uh, you can measure it like this. You can measure it accurately, the uh, cone. Uh, but uh, the advantage of Vicente Omni system is it is coupled with the topography system. So you can see the topographic data also. This is the post C3R. After C3, you can see the hyperreflectivity in the anterior 50 microns, and you can measure that also. This is a conventional C3 has been done. As you know, the hyperreflectivity is maximally seen in the first uh, one month of C3R. After that, it starts fading away. This is a transepithelial C3 air. The amount of uh, hyperreflectivity that you see is not very much. Intracorneal rings can be. Uh, can be documented very well in this. No great advantage of doing any OCT here. While what in this patient, this got the diffuse photograph is perfectly normal. But if you take a slit image, you can see that the cornea from the periphery it is thinning over here, and there is some curvature of the cornea over here. This is a classic pellucid marginal corneal degeneration. We have a thinning of the cornea in the peripheral one to two millimeter area, and the steepening occurs. Uh, of the cornea occurs above that. Ectasia occurs above that. That is what is seen. So this is the area where the corneal thinning is there. While this area, you can see that there is a ectasia. There is a change in shape of the cornea here. The central corneal thickness is perfectly normal. This can be confirmed by topography also. Uh, topography, you can see this classic pattern. What do you call this pattern? This is a crab claw pattern or kissing PGN sign. So this is, I think, uh, topographic information tell you that there is a there is a crab claw pattern. Like this area, there is a uh, there are two bows of the type which are sort of bent to each other, and it is also called a lazy eight pattern. You can draw eight like this, and if it's a lazy eight, you can see like this. Okay. So in the pachymetry map, it is almost normal. While if you see the anti-elevation map, this is the point I think one uh, doctor had asked. In early keratoconus, this may be really missed. Uh, even in a placido-based image, in the central, say five millimeter area, you don't see much of a difference. While beyond that, you can see that there is a area of elevation. So this is corresponding to pellucid marginal corneal degeneration. Same thing here in the fellow eye. I think the left eye was more advanced than the right eye. So being convinced about the diagnosis, you go ahead with the C3R. You know that you'll cause an endothelial burn over here, uh, but you still go ahead with the C3R and see, as expected, you see an endothelial burn. High drops can be seen in uh, anterior segment OCT like this. You can see the clefts in the corneal stroma. And this is the area where uh, the decimates membrane has separated and it has crawled up. This would be much better seen in the other uh, device. A, a swept source OCT would pick this up much better. DM scroll in Hydrops, another example. CHED or uh, hereditary endothelial dystrophy, congenital hereditary endothelial dystrophy. You can, uh, the, there are two forms. The common form is the autosomal uh, recessive form in which you see that uh, uh, the corneal thickness is very high in the central part. The corneal thickness is coming to uh, 930 microns or almost double the normal corneal thickness. This is a patient who has got a peripheral ulcerative keratitis. Uh, you can see that there is the ulceration can actually be documented in this. Like, can you see this here? There is an overhanging edge. If you have a uh, necrotic material there, you'll not be able to see. Sometimes you'll be able to see this overhanging edge very well. Patient with uh, a corneal dystrophy, you can see that it is spread all around the cornea from epithelium to endothelium, whole areas involved. Intervening area is hazy. 
you can see the even the undulations in the Desmet's membrane. And the corneal thickness is slightly on the lower side. It's about 480 microns. So all these suggestive of a macular dystrophy. Uh, the patient underwent the keratoplasty. You can even see that you evaluate your, critically analyze your results. You can see that the position is much better here, while here the position is not great. There is a small posterior uh, ledge of the donor cornea here. Uh, post keratoplasty, this is something very useful. Uh, graph dehiscence and uh, resultant ectasia can be documented very well in a, a patient like this. Uh, this is an example of band keratopathy. You can see that the pathology hyperreflectivity is limited to the anterior 100 or 120 microns, which tells you that it is only in the anterior stroma. Mostly the Bowman, Bowman's membrane is involved. This again would be, I think, slightly better, uh, better seen in swept source OCT. And after a BTK, you can see that it is normal. This is uh, helpful for anterior stromal pathology. You see patients like this with uh, diffuse anterior stromal scarring. You measure the area of scarring. You can see that it's only about 100 or 160 microns in this. So you can uh, go ahead with it. Uh, if you are doing an automated amyloid like keratoplasty, you can just remove 180 microns and uh, suture it back and uh, replace it with a normal 180 microns of donor corneal stroma. So this is what I did. Uh, so after that, the corneal scar, the anterior stromal scar is taken care of. Another anterior stromal scar, but this is seen to be slightly more denser. It is more than about, I think it's coming to 250 microns or so, even more than that. So we have to go for a much deeper cut. So we went with, again, an automated anterior lamellar keratoplasty was done. This with a 300 micron blade. So this much is 300 micron. So then you have a, uh, this is the donor cornea. Sorry, the recipient corneal stroma, which is untouched. So, and you put sutures uh, about, I think uh, you can get away with uh, 12 sutures or so. And the corneal cornea is made there. This is useful, uh, not just in lamella, uh, in, uh, it can use, be useful in endothelial keratoplasty as well. Endothelial keratoplasty, you can see the location of the button. I think you'd have seen uh, multiple images from Sujit. Uh, so this is a patient who has undergone, uh, has got a bullous keratopathy, a large bullet right in the center, about uh, one week after the transplant, one week or uh, I think two weeks after the transplant, you can see that the cornea is somewhat clear. You can, there's no need to do a OCT to uh, document the attrition of the graft, but you can show to the patient that is the advantage of having an OCT. That's what I feel the, the great advantage of OCT, nothing else. Really. So you can see that the graft is well adhered. There's no spaces in between suggesting a proper adhesion of the graft. You can actually evaluate the <clears throat> graft also. You can. Uh, evaluate the results of the graph. Like you can see that here it is about 0.29 or 0.3 uh, uh, millimeters or one. Uh, it's coming to about 0.3 millimeters in this side. Well, here it is only 0.2, less than 0.2 millimeters. So there is some disparity in the graph between this area and that area. While in this, you can see that it's almost universally 0 0.6, 0 0.16 or 1. 160 microns all around. This, I think it is a, uh, again, a DSAE it was done, a discipline stripping, uh, automated endothelial keratoplasty was done with a micro -keratoma. I think there was an error in the calculation. We cut a very thick corneal stroma. So quite often when you do automated uh, endothelial keratoplasty, everything is not perfectly under your control. So you sometimes you cut a large button. So in this, you can see that it is more than 200 microns in thickness. And that's why the cornea is appearing more easy. In cut. This patient uh, will not have uh, very good vision. The vision would be somewhere in the range of 618 to 612. This is a one day picture post uh, DSEK. You can see that the graft is sitting there. But uh, even in the slit, lamp, you can see that there is some space between the donor stroma and the uh, 
chronostoma and the recipient, which is evident in the anterior segment of CT. You can see the incision over here. The graft is really thick. Most likely, this is a primary graft failure. And uh, I could uh, find out a small error in the procedure that I did also. Some bit of placement membrane is left here. So this is, uh, I think, uh, ASOC is very useful in refractive surgery. This is a patient who had undergone refractive surgery some time ago and was left with a 1.5 diopter of uh, residual myopia. So was considering the option of a, a repeat procedure. So if you want to do a repeat procedure, you want to exactly measure the stromal bed. There's no point in knowing the whole corneal thickness. So you know the whole corneal thickness is coming to 470 micron, but you need an OCT to know the uh, thickness of the underlying stroma. So when we measured it, we found that it's about 0.37 or 370 microns. Uh, so 1.5 diopters can very easily be corrected. So this is another very important use of uh, SOCT, phakic eyeball planning. Uh, as you know, phakic intraocular lenses, so the popular one being uh, posterior chamber lenses, it is kept in front of the crystalline lens, so behind the iris. So you have to, you can uh, have to take multiple measurements of the cornea. So you can measure uh, wide to wide diameter like this, but this based on an OCT measurement. So I have had compared it with uh, this uh, caliper based uh, calculation as well as uh, uh, compared with Pendacam also in some cases and found that this is not very accurate. Even though you, theoretically you can say that it is useful to measure, practically it is not very useful because you want to know exactly the sulcus to sulcus diameter. But within the anterior chamber, whatever measurements you want to do, you can see. Sulcus to sulcus also cannot be really measured with the SOCT because because of the shadowing, because of the iris here, you cannot exactly see the sulcus here. This is a post-op patient who has undergone a, a fakic oil. You can see that uh, this is the IOL here, and there is vaulting, good vaulting. There is space between the IOL and the crystalline lens. It is coming to 0.53 or 530 uh, microns. So that is a very healthy distance. may not be very clear for you, but you can see the anterior corneal, I think it's not very apparent in this, but this is an example of a patient with a wheel Marchesani syndrome with a very shallow anterior chamber. You see the anterior chamber depth. From the anterior lenticular surface to the endothelium, it's only 1.37 millimeter. You can see a very crowded anterior chamber. You can use it for angle assessment. SOCT, there are tools available with which we can measure the angle. You can approximately measure like this, but there are more refined system to do it. You have got a software tool which can be kept exactly at the squiggle spur and based on which you can measure the squiggle spur angle. So most of the time you'll be able to identify the squiggle spur like this. Uh, about 80-85% of the time you'll be able to identify, but not in all cases. So this is the squiggle spur. Squiggle is coming. It's like a spur over here. So you have to keep the uh, cap the tool exactly over here, then only it can measure it. The spiral spur angle is showing as 40.9, which is perfectly fine. I think there are certain parameters which are better known to glaucoma surgeons. TISA 500 is something that they consider very important. But the same thing, you can make a mistake in keeping the uh, software tool. If you keep it here, it will be totally inaccurately measured. Actually, the squirrel spur is coming over here, so this should come here. So you have to do it properly also, then only you can get a proper assessment. Angle foreign bodies, metallic foreign bodies sometimes cause severe shadowing and can give rise to appearance like this, as if the iris is split. In glaucoma, it is useful to measure the bleb. Actually, uh, uh, the multicystic blebs can really be measured, and that is a efficacy. That is a indicator of the uh, efficiency of the trabeculectomy surgery that you have done. So this is a patient who is having multi-cystic bleb. You can see the elevation of the bleb and multi-cystic spaces. 
while a flat blood would appear flat, even the scleral ostium is closed. You can see that the uh, ostium is here and that the iris is come and closed over here. If you want to consider regraft, uh, if you have a patient like this, you do an OCT and see that uh, the iris is in close proximity with the grafted cornea. I don't think uh, regraft is a very good idea. The other eye vision is good. You see in multiple quadrants and you see that a lot of Seneca are there all around. It's not a good idea to do a, a, to a, another keratoplasty. Oasis and also can be documented with, uh, with uh, anterior segment OCT. But with the swept source OCT, this is better documented because the epithelium, hyperreflectivity in the epithelium can be very well be documented with the swept source OCT. And that is a, a very uh, characteristic sign of ocular surface squamous neoplasia, which, is, uh, which has been uh, described since about four or five years. So I don't think I'll go into more details. So I would uh, conclude saying that it's anterior segment OCT is a very useful device in refractive surgery. It is a value addition for you in uh, corneal practice and more than the uh, use to you and more than uh, the ability to document you, it aids in explanation to the patient because a lot of these things will not be, uh, unless you show it, it will not be very apparent to the patient. Thank you. So actually for topography, which all patients you need, that is all astigmatic patients, you need to do topography or clinically when you suspect like, oh, the wish. So actually what is it written? Okay, it's, uh, I think it's, uh, it's difficult to say, but if you see that the, uh, uh, the amount of cylindrical power is less, like something like 2.5, uh, it is okay. Second thing is you look at the axis. If it is in, or if it is a 90 or 180, again it is very likely to be normal. But at the same time, if it is an oblique cylinder, then uh, you have to view it with suspicion. And uh, like uh, this, uh, I think uh, the suspicion of keratoconus or in fact any corneal ectasia should be more. Indexial suspicion should be more. And uh, more importantly, you have to document the patient very, uh, very well. Okay, so basically serial uh, measurement is something important. You see that the power is uh, appearing stable, then it's okay. But having said all that, it's uh, quite worthwhile to pick up early keratoconus so that you can uh, tell patients what it is. So once you do a topography, then if you see that it's a very symmetric bow tie and everything is perfect, uh, fitting into a astigmatic, normal regular astigmat pattern, you know that the patient, if there is no need to follow up and all that. So it makes sense if there is a significant cylinder, especially if it is in a public access. Okay, sir. See, so suppose, sir, if you do a corneal topography, that plasto based, and if, suppose it is normal, every, there is a myopic astigmatism, mission is improving to 6 6. Do we know, uh, need to do other uh, investigations like Pentacam or OBSCAN? Okay. Uh, okay, fine. Uh, see, uh, if the vision is 6 by 6 and the topography is normal, unless the patient is uh, needing refractive surgery, I don't think it is really good. Okay. You need to look at the topography again if the patient is uh, 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 documenting sudden change in power. Again. Then only you need to go for any higher uh, imaging system like a pentacam. Otherwise, uh, I think uh, this plasto-based imaging system is very sensitive in picking up regular uh, keratoconus. In fact, some 10 years ago, people were having only plasto-based imaging and uh, uh, I think uh, that is quite okay. okay. Again, if we detect this uh, subclinical keratoconus, how, or how frequently you should follow up, like in, by, suppose by using Pentacam, we uh, saw that the patient is having subclinical keratoconus. Okay. So, I have subclinical keratoconus, that is not any indication for treatment. Mm -hmm. uh, the treatment, the consideration for treatment will depend on a lot of other factors like whether there is a genetic predisposition. If for one of uh, his siblings, his or her siblings have got keratoconus, the chance of keratoconus is high. Then you go for a more frequent follow-up. Oh. Then uh, try to look at other risk factors, whatever is there. Like uh, if there is some source of eye rubbing, you should uh, try to avoid eye rubbing. 
Uh, and uh, I think uh, I would uh, basically, if there is a subclinical keratoconus, I would uh, follow up the patient every six months or so. But again, if there is something uh, like, uh, if there is some other risk factor involved, maybe more closer follow up required. I think, uh, I think a lot of people have this confusion that it's either normal or keratoconus. I think there is a big gray area in between. Uh, subclinical keratoconus uh, or there are certain patients which are not perfectly suitable for refractive surgery but they do not qualify to be called keratoconus. So such patients will not uh, have any problem if you leave them alone. Actually that's a very wonderful session. We also had many grey areas no sir while seeing the reports and all with so many colours. <laughs> we, we also actually had many confusions. And that was a very nice talk, sir. Uh, I think there are no much questions. Well, laptop, I think. Uh, to start their videos if possible. Yeah. You can mute, but. Yeah, mute, but please yeah. start your videos. At least, uh, Dr. Anil can see the PG soon he has start. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, friends, you have no doubts. Mean I request Dr. Ani to ask you few questions, <laughs> some exam based questions, or exam point of view. Is it okay? Doctor Sujit is muted. <laughs> I hope Sujit had a good nap in between. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, sir. I, I was trying something else, actually. Uh, I was on the technical part. <laughs> trying to do the YouTube uh, live and all those things. Friends, so, but please I was, start your video. But uh, I was listening to you, sir. <laughs> please switch on your videos. You can mute. Next time on one video, on another day, to earn a And you don't exam point of view and the questions you give, Rona. Exam point of view questions. Yeah, please. You better ask some questions or doubts, no? Otherwise, sir, we'll <laughs> give some questions. No problem, it's good for you. See, if you yeah, are, please know the questions, you can find the answers later, no? Uh, I really don't know, sir, but uh, is it like uh, this uh, topography? Uh, uh, Santhya can answer better. Like uh, for the PG exams, how do they keep these topographies? Do they keep it for uh, uh, chart reading or uh, OSCE? Yeah, yeah, yeah. In uh, that afternoon session, Viva session, we usually keep this topography charts. Uh, so, what do they normally ask? Like, uh, most probably they may be asking you to uh, determine uh, keratoconus. Yeah, yeah. No, first, basically, you have to read the chart and then they may ask questions later based on that. Yeah, I think that is so more how, important. Like how yeah, yeah. How, how, to uh, read the, yeah. how to read the chart in a, uh, I mean, methodical yeah. way. That is probably that uh, yeah. they may be looking at. So if it is clear for our PGs, then I think then uh, the purpose is served. Yeah, I'll check that, sir. Next day when I go to the college, I'll check whether they are clear. Okay, any questions? No more questions, no doubts. And they have taken the class so well, they have no doubts at all. <laughs> Sujit, there are doubts, there are any questions? Sujit? No, sir. I don't know. 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 I don't
പ്രസന്റബിൾ അല്ലാത്തോണ്ടായിരിക്കും വീഡിയോ ഓൺ കോഴിക്കോട് <laughs> Yeah, so Jinsi. all the all Dr. Jinsi. Is there in this Jinsi? Yeah, she was there. Uh, name Jinsi, yeah. are you there? So it's a proud moment for Kolkata Medical College as well as a great uh, moment of happiness for our PGs. So and today yeah. both two of our PGs had cleared the DNB exam. The DNB oftal results are out. Two of them had appeared, two of them are clear. Okay, great. Nikita and Sumita. Nikita, Sumita, are you there? no okay bye if there are no more questions uh, we can conclude the session i think yeah uh so it's i think it's my role to say the word of thanks uh it's a very um in in a formal way i have to speak to dr anil because <laughs> it's very <laughs> he's like a very uh, close friend and a very uh uh respectful senior to me so thank you sir for accepting our invitation and uh, taking this uh, very uh, very uh, informative class on uh, topography as well as the anterior segment oct uh, i always uh, uh, feel so your audio is muted so your audio is muted sir just unmute yourself so just unmute you and oh okay Uh, i had a call in between so uh, basically you get a lot of data on that uh, print out you need not uh, uh, look at all the data you need to uh, you need to know what actual data you are looking at you have to pick up the uh, data that you really want it so i think uh, uh, anil sir's uh, talk was very clear on those uh, uh, facts and it will be a very useful uh, uh, informative talk for them this will be a recorded and uh, this will be a uh, uh, the recorded version will be shared with them so they can have a repeated look at every time they see a <coughs> topographic chart and uh, thank you very much sir uh, we, we may call you again for uh, yeah, our future meetings also so uh, thank you very much for uh, giving time for uh, meeting today thank you dr santhia for moderating this session uh, and uh, coordinating with all the pgs and uh, we, we had more than 60 pgs uh, uh, as participants today that's a very good number uh, so thank you very much for coordinating with pgs and thank you all pgs for joining today and we have five more modules coming up uh, in uh, next uh, every week on every saturdays for the next five weeks so we expect uh, such good participation in all the good uh, all the coming uh, modules uh, in every module this time we are planning to give talks on chart readings various aspects various special sub specialties of ophthalmology thank you dr mehir for uh, uh, coordinating this meeting uh, and i uh, thank you all the scientific committee members and vigilish madam for the support provided thank you uh, ajinda for giving us this platform for uh, welcome, this welcome sir welcome so thank you all happy amana joll of you thank you for this meeting madam i have a doubt huh? how do you motivate the 60 people to come <laughs> i think for <laughs> for post graduates it's a very big uphill task to <laughs> call 10 people that's no? why a special thanks to dr sandhya <laughs> and uh, <laughs> uh, so it is uh, actually uh, uh, this is uh, more than what we expected uh, we expected a, a, a smaller crowd but we wanted this to be exclusively for pgs and i expect that uh, other than this office bearers there are uh, no one else other than the pgs okay. so uh, maybe uh, out of the 65 almost 50 52 are almost 55 are pg so that's a very good number actually yeah, yeah, so they announced that tomorrow's meeting also so that they can be ready tomorrow yeah yeah tomorrow we have got a monthly meeting on uh, glaucoma webinar uh, webinar on glaucoma 
uh, with uh, very good national and international speakers. So uh, all the participants uh, today, uh, you are uh, given a gentle reminder for tomorrow's program. The details will be shared in the group. So you can join us. I will say you can also learn a little bit of glaucoma. So you can. Really won't be compulsory tomorrow. So come prepare no problem. <laughs> Okay, so that's all, and uh, I think we can conclude this session. And thank you all for joining. So thank you very much, sir, for giving us an opportunity to serve you in this platform. And we would like to be part with your future endeavors also, sir, from Ajanta. Thank you, thank you, thank you Ajanta. Thank you all. Good night. Take care. Good night. Yes. Thank you. Happy Anam. Thank you. Happy Anam. Good night, all. Happy Anam. Thank you, Anil, sir. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Dr. Anil. Happy Anam. Yeah, same to you. Same to you. Yes. Yeah.